All right, guys, welcome back to the What Is Money show. I am here today, very excited to dive into what I think is going to be perhaps one of the most important series we've ever done on this show. Uh, I'm sitting down today with Mike Hill, and we're going to be recording long form, uh, diving deep into a really important book. First, let's give you a little bit, bit of background on Mike. Mike is a design consultant and philosopher in the film and game industry. He's worked on a number of big projects with major clients like Netflix, Warner Brothers, Sony, NASA, JPL, HBO, Activision, Microsoft, David Fincher, uh, worked with Tim Miller on Deadpool, Love, Death and Robots, Game of Thrones, Call of Duty, Halo and Horizon Zero Dawn, and also worked on the, the film Blade Runner 2049 and Dune. So Mike's a brilliant guy, um, and he is the one who introduced me to this book, Leela, some time ago. And I have referred people to this book as part of a trilogy for breaking down your materialist worldview and opening your eyes to the non-materialist side of reality. And the three books I've recommended together were Leela. Human Action by Mises, and Maps of Meaning by Jordan Peterson. And I think these three books jive really well together. Um, but this, so this book, Leela, subtitle is An Inquiry into Morals, was written in 1991. And it's exploring this complex topic called The Metaphysics of Quality. And this book basically draws connections between evolution, culture, morality and theology in a very deep way. And it's written by Robert Persig, who's best known for his original book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which was written in 1974, uh, which is one of the best selling philosophy books of all time. But interestingly enough, so few people have heard about Leela, which was written, um, you know, a couple of decades later. And in my opinion, and I think you'll see in, in Mike's opinion, and for, for reasons we're going to lay out thoroughly here, I think Leela is actually the more important work. And it does this, it's presenting almost a unified theory, if you will, overlaying these different segments of thought or scientific bodies that were formerly disconnected or divided. This book is bringing them all under one umbrella in a really interesting and compelling way. He's blended it into this fictional narrative, but it also has this um, rigorous scientific analysis along with it. So it's really just a fascinating book. So I'm super excited to dive in. And with all of that mouthful of introduction, <laughs> Mike Hill, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Robert. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I, I second all of that enthusiasm. Um, I, for one, think that Leela is is one of the most underappreciated and and underread books. Um, and the the only way that I can think to to kind of emphasize how important I think it is is that you know during the Copernican Revolution uh, there were several um, attempts to get some of the theories into the kind of cultural consensus before the actual heliocentric model took hold. Mm. And I, I'm of the belief that Leela represents a, a step towards a, a unifying theory that that makes all of today's confusions when it comes to religion versus science and determinism versus free will. Um, this book effectively unplugs us all from the system that gives us that confusion. Um, and I, I think that's just an incredible achievement. And uh, hopefully posthumously, Piercing is going to go down in history as as solving a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, well, brilliantly put. Um, this book definitely changes your perspective of how you're looking at the world. So the Copernican revolution analogy is apt there. And I agree with you. I hope this series helps propel this work to broader awareness because it is really important. Um, with that, I think, as we discussed earlier, I think the best place to start here would be to give the audience a little bit of background on Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance itself. You know, what was the premise mm -hmm. of that book? Uh, how is it, you know, I guess we could talk about how it exploded onto the scene, frankly, is bringing philosophy 
to a mainstream audience in a way that you know wasn't really yeah. uh, happening so much in the 70s and then we could talk a bit about persig himself uh i know he has a very interesting backstory which ties into a lot of the the topics covered in in his works zen came out in 1974 and it was met immediately with huge success, even though he had taken the book to, I think, 120 publishers who all turned him down. Um, and then the one publisher that released it kind of recognized that it was broaching a subject that was massively important, especially in a world that was at the time, you know, West and East were kind of divided. You had Western culture was moving in one direction. Eastern culture had a different trajectory in terms of philosophy. You know, you had scientific rationalism in some sense in the West. And in the East, you had holistic, much more rooted philosophies that were, had been around for thousands of years. And the book was Piercing's first attempt to solve a question that was raised really quite unexpectedly. He was teaching creative writing in the late sixties. And one of his uh, kind of colleagues asked him, you know, is, is, your, is your course quality? He was struck by the idea that we all know what quality is, but when we attempt to define it or capture it, what exactly quality is composed of evades us. In order to understand why he was obsessed with that question and what he eventually created was Zen, where he tries to create a way of understanding quality by first trying to deconstruct a worldview that we've had since Aristotle, which is subject object metaphysics, and the reason that he became obsessed with that particular, let's say, attack vector with trying to understand what quality is, is that he recognized that the big problem is the, is, is quality in the subject or is quality in the object? So when, right. you, when someone says, oh, that has quality, is it purely a subjective phenomenon that, that somebody is believes something has quality or is it in the object? And how can you verify either? And of course, you can't verify either. You yeah. can't. You can't say uh, that, you know, if you love, uh, if you think that your family member has quality and you, you, you value them because of that, is that just a superstition or is there value that we can look at in your family member through a microscope and we can identify, oh yeah, there's, there's value running through their veins, you know, doesn't, it, you know, that doesn't quite add up. I think would be very helpful. And if this is, this is not the right time, please correct me if I'm wrong, but to define metaphysics. It's a big, scary word for a lot of people. Um, and then if we, you know, we're talking a lot, of, again, it's the metaphysics of quality. Uh, this is very closely related to value and values. So I don't know if there's any um, specificity you want to add around those terms as well. But I think those are key building blocks to everything we're going to be talking about throughout this series. I'll actually read the, the, the sort of definition that, that Piercing gives in, in Zen. Metaphysics is what Aristotle called the first philosophy. It's a collection of the most general statements of a hierarchical structure of thought. It is the part of philosophy which deals with the nature and structure of reality itself. So it's effectively the outermost sandbox in which every other discipline sits, mm. you know, inside of. Right. So in that regard, it's it's also the most abstract. So that's a great definition of metaphysics, um, which is also, I think, Piercing calls this later on the high country of the mind, which is something we can we can revisit. Um, and it's the metaphysics of quality. So, but quality is a term, as you've already said, very ambivalent. Is it subjective? Is it objective? Is it somewhere in between? And this term also, which this ties it back into economics, which clearly this show has a lot of um, connections to, is quality is closely related to the concept of value and values. And all, and we'll, as we will see when we go into this book, that actually, I guess Piercing would argue that value and values are almost derivative of quality. What context would you add there between those terms, uh, quality and value? So when you say something has value or, you know, it means yeah. that it will inspire and motivate action. And if yeah. action is the foundation of, of life, yes. then value is the undefinable quality that inspires action through the valuation of it. Yeah, that, that's great. So it's um, 
we're almost using the word quality as to point towards the ineffable thing <laughs> that inspires human action. And so the, the example I commonly like to give to this is all action is in fact an expression of value, right? To walk from one side of the room to the other indicates to the world and to yourself that you valued the being on the other side of the room more than where you were originally. So, um, and this get, and this will, will connect some dots here, but you know, value has sort of multiple dimensions as well. You know, you can have aesthetic value, you can have economic value, you can have moral value, but Piercing's work actually ties them all together, which is really fascinating. Yes, and I think we can just broach this right now. At the foundation of Piercing's theory is, and this matches with similar theories from people like John Wheeler, who was um, mm -hmm. a, phys a quantum physicist who worked with uh, Richard Feynman. Mm -hmm. um, and he came up with a theory called the participatory universe, mm -hmm. which is that actually implicitly the entire universe is a conscious marketplace. Mm -hmm. And what Piercing states is that um, the metaphysics of quality suggests or proposes that everything is conscious and is making choices from the cells to you know electrons to um, to mass to uh, cellular biology everything is making actions based upon a value system which using the context of plan b's stock to flow model is like phase transitioning through properties as an entity becomes more evolutionarily complex. Mm -hmm. So at the low grade level of, you know, a bac bacterium, it will value something, i.e. it will love something that will, ins it, that will inspire action in it mm -hmm. that will be unrecognizable from us in our context of, of valuing a child in our family because as evolution, uh, as evolution becomes more complex, the evolutionary uh, development becomes more complex. The nature, the emergent property of value itself changes as an emergent property of the complexity. Right. Which is to to use the Bitcoin analogy, as Bitcoin's market cap increases, its properties will change as it becomes larger in, in much the same way that, that water's properties change as temperature changes. Mm -hmm, it's the mm -hmm. same fundamental element, right. but when it's low temperature, it's frozen. When it's room temperature, it's liquid. When it's yep. ionized, it's gas. Yeah. It's properties change, but it doesn't. Right. And these are, these are the, the layers that it may be too early to bring these in, but just to mention them, there are layers to the static side of quality, the inorganic layer, the biological layer, the social layer, and the idea layer. Um, maybe too early to bring those in. I know we're, we're getting off track already. We have to talk about very dense material, a lot of pathways to cut through it. But I do think it's important that we hit on Piercig's life story a little bit, his educational background, because I think that this gives a lot of credence to the text. Yeah, let's let's hook into that because I think that once we've got Piercing's mind view or mindset, I think that's going to become like a, a great way to see the world through his eyes and what he was trying to solve and what what problems he saw with the existing system that mm. we all live in right now. And our, our misconceptions about the world is what's kind of tearing the world apart. You know, scientific yes. rationalism has become its own religion. Um, a lot of people don't believe in religion, but in the absence of it, we've made other things idols. Uh, like science and it's um, we're, we're losing you know everything's falling apart and i think mm -hmm. people can see that it's yep. 8th of july 2021 it might, might have fallen apart before this podcast comes out um <laughs> so okay so I'll, I'll i'll do give the long story short on piercing so born in 1928 uh in minnesota uh by the age of nine he was uh, he had an iq of 170 so this was one incredibly smart human being um, he skipped all of the, the sort of standard educational uh, checkpoints. He was studying biochemistry um, by the age of 15 at the University of Minnesota. And he, even at that age, from what I've read in his biography, which is quite difficult, you know, he's a, he's a very private person. So his background is quite um, difficult to get hold of. He, at the age of 15, much like Stephen Hawking, 
he had a kind of intuition that that there should be a unifying theory that would explain the universe and the world and you know all the confusion that we have in the world you know surely science and he he was of the belief that science would would hold answers so he studied biochemistry so this this was a guy coming at a very advanced level into into the you know into the sciences and he hit a roadblock at, at that age uh, between 15 and 18 where he he identified a problem for him that became systemic which was that he recognized that science so what science proposes to be it cannot actually be ever because of an issue that he saw with hypotheses which is that you can make hypotheses after hypotheses and always generate new hypotheses uh, on, a, on a given problem forever um, and the amount of hypotheses that you could generate would always grow quicker and exponentially larger than any test that you could ever conduct. So even when you quote unquote proved something correct, there could be a hypothesis which would generate a better answer than the one that you've already proven. But because of the nature of hypotheses growing, mm -hmm. um, science has to forever remain a, um, an inconclusive subject. Piercing says, for every fact, there is an infinity of hypotheses. At first, he found it amusing. He coined a law intended to have the humor of a Parkinson's law that the number of rational hypotheses that can explain any given phenomenon is infinite. It pleased him never to run out of hypotheses. It was only months after he had coined the law that he began to have some doubt about the humor or benefits of it. If true, that law is not a minor flaw in scientific reasoning. The law is completely nihilistic. It is a catastrophic logical disproof of the general validity of all scientific method. If the purpose of the scientific method is to select from among a multitude of hypotheses, and if the number of hypotheses grows faster than the experimental method can handle, then it is clear that all hypotheses can never be tested. If all hypotheses cannot be tested, then the results of any experiment are inconclusive and the entire scientific method falls short of its goal of establishing proven knowledge the more answers you derive scientifically it the, the number of questions or, or additional po potential answers in the form of hypotheses grows non-linear to your quote-unquote proven hypotheses so it so it's it, it's uh exponentially unresolvable Exponent, exactly yeah. so it is actually a it's a paradox just another way to think about this is I know he a lot of this is rooted in the subject object duality and science the the pretext of science is that it eliminates all subjectivity from analysis essentially what it's trying to do is eliminate value from analysis to leave only the objective value free world but in that pursuit he found this irreconcilable this paradox where value or subjectivity had to somehow be included, which made him question the very premise of subject object duality. Yes, and, and at this stage, I don't think that he even had a conception of value or quality. I think he was just yep. seeing that the, the practical promise of science was already a paradox. Yes. Uh, yes. So he kind of gave up on that and then went, joined the army, went to South Korea and he, and he, he said that he and a lot of the people in the military with him were exposed to the East, so Japan, South Korea, mm -hmm. and they were impressed by what he can only describe as a vibrancy in these mm -hmm. cultures that didn't seem to exist in the, the kind of rational cultures of the West, you know, so in the East where Zen exists and uh, in South Korea where it's a different set of values that were, was in some sense contradictory to the West, but also the military guys found it enthralling. Mm -hmm. So after he uh, finished his service in 1948, he came back to the US, didn't want to go back into the sciences, and he read a book by a guy called Northup. The gist of it was reconciling the West and East. You mm -hmm. know, and it was a book about the, the cultural division. He was fascinated by why there was a division at all. And 1950, so within a year of reading this book, he went and studied Hindu and Eastern philosophy in India. So he went, you know, skin in the game. He didn't just read books about it. He went out to India and then he spent uh, a lot of time there studying uh, Eastern philosophy mm -hmm. and the Tao and Zen. 
and realize that there's a whole different way of seeing the world that science can't comprehend. And then fast forward to sort of 1958, he was teaching creative writing courses uh, at some university. And that's where he was struck with the question of, you know, while teaching creative writing, there is no right and wrong. There is no scientific objectivity. Everything is subjective in creative writing. Mm -hmm. You know, so he was mm -hmm. he was teaching rhetoric, which is the art of persuasion. Mm -hmm. And we'll go down the rabbit hole with connections of how Aristotle's rhetoric connects all sorts of fascinating things that reinforces Piercing's later theories as well as ties into neuroscience. Um, but that's when he went down the rabbit hole with quality, and then things that question took him off the rails. Um, so within a couple of years of trying to answer the question of what is quality, mm -hmm. what is what is is subjective value just a superstition or is it real? Because we clearly we have communities that share values, so mm -hmm. they've got to be real. But he couldn't identify what they were or even define them. Mm -hmm. His mental health deteriorated to the point where he had a he he kind of was he was institutionalized. He ended up in a catatonic state. He was um, given electroconvulsive treatment. He was nearly lobotomized mm. because he went so off the deep end with this exploration of the concept of quality that he had, you know, for want of a better word, I think a kind of something akin to what Eckhart Tolle said he had, which is where he kind of had overnight, like, like a everything fell away. And, you know, mm. like the idea of, everything he believed just disappeared yeah but where where Eckhart Tolle came out of that and was just immediately like life's pretty good Pearson came out of that with electroconvulsive treatment and wow. his life destroyed and and then that was the beginning of a, a nine-year process where he had to try and put words to the experience of an enlightenment as it were followed mm -hmm. by an electric convulsive you know abuse of his brain he lost his family He's traveled the world, he's seen lots of things, <clears throat> got stuck on a question, and then he's destroyed his own personality and trying to solve it. And that's what Zen, Zen was the product of that process. Mm -hmm. um, so Piersig, you know, is one, one of those guys that you can genuinely argue is not an armchair philosopher, like he's, he's been through it all, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when the book came out in 1974, Zen, he was um, given funding to do whatever he wanted. And for 15 years, he pondered. And in the meantime, by the way, the Zen, the, the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is the format of it is him traveling the country on a motorbike with his son, Chris. Right. So it's part fiction, part uh, kind of road, not like journal. Mm -hmm. And his son, Chris, uh, who grew up to become a Zen Buddhist, um, a few years after the, the first book was released, his son was murdered outside of a Zen monastery um, in San Francisco. So like piercing, wow. if, if there is ever a, a embodiment of that idea of the martyr, you know, being crucified, this guy had it all. The backstory is, is very compelling. I actually wasn't aware of his son being, being murdered. Um, I mean, you know, philosophy is something that gives you a why of life, I think a why of existence. And it seems like he was really put to the test in, in every way one of the large driving points of him, his inquiry further into this subject after he felt like he had kind of, you know, effectively sealed the deal with Zen was one of the questions was, where did Chris go? Mm. You know, like what happened wow. to Chris when he died? And that's when the pursuit of the idea of patterns of value rather than um, objects or, or, or materialism, um, he started to see the world in, in abstract patterns. Mm which became the foundation of Leela's uh, moral hierarchy of, of, of metaphysical quality. Yeah. So that's a, that's a lot of background there. And I think, like you say, the, the difficult thing here now is that these two books are so nutrient dense and so all encompassing and so carefully thought out that where to start is the difficult thing. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we can start with Aristotle um, and just talk a little bit about how influential he has been. And I think, I think um, you know, I'm sure a large percentage of the audience watching this will be familiar with Bitcoin and the, the, the general clarifying capabilities of, of, you know, say Austrian economics, 
in mm -hmm. explaining the nature of uh, the world of economics versus Keynesian economics, which which is there's a lot of false uh, claims in Keynesian economics, which which makes the world messy and broken, and it increases the level of suffering and reduces the level of freedom, mm -hmm. and that's because it's it's a false framework. Right. In the same way that that Mises Austrian economics clarified the problems with uh, Keynesian fiat economics, Robert Piercig's what he calls metaphysics of quality goes a long way to fixing the problems that have been caused in the world by Aristotle's subject-object metaphysics. Yeah. It is as important for us to understand uh, this metaphysics as it is for us to understand Austrian economics versus Keynes. And in that same way, Piercig's Leela offers the ability to say, well, once you understand this model, you can suddenly see all the problems with Aristotle's subject-object metaphysics. Right that were previously hidden from you, even though they were hidden in plain sight. Yes. Um, and in that sense, it's also similar to the Copernican revolution, which is none of the objects of observation have changed, uh, but their relationship to each other has. Yeah. And, you know, after Copernic uh, Copernicus, you know, observed that the earth is not the center of the universe, the observable, observable universe didn't change, mm -hmm. but by simply shifting the perspective of believing that the earth was the center of all of these observations, mm -hmm we suddenly had a massively increased ability to explore the possibilities of, of, of the future because we had a more pragmatic model to see reality in. And that's what metaphysics is. It's a, it's a model of reality that we can use to act. Yeah, very well said. And this Copernican revolution is a great analogy because to your point, we didn't change any of the data necessarily. It was the interpretation of the data that was so transformational. And this will yeah. come back into play as we, we get deeper into the metaphysics of quality. And then secondarily, the Copernican revolution was a perspectival shift, right? We, went to, yeah. we just changed our perspective on the world from being we are the center of the universe to you know the sun is at least the center of our solar system. And clearly that perspectival shift continued into the present day. So I love the analogy here of, and this is, I think, a really useful way to think about it, taking off this pair of subject object glasses. So this is the lens mm. through which we view the world and putting on a new pair of glasses. So I would just encourage the audience to approach this subject matter with an open mind and look at it that mm. way. It's not that someone's trying to give you a new idea to be looked at it's a new way of looking at ideas itself so mm -hmm. it's, it's very fundamental it's very meta you must you know as uh they say in meditation look at what is looking in a way to really yeah. understand um where this is going and i think your point too with austrian economics in relation to keynesian economics is like persig's metaphysics of quality in relationship to aristotle's subject object metaphysics that rings very true for me as well. Hey, everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So, whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. Aristotle was a polymath who had his fingers in every discipline that, that we use today from you know, physics, biology, zoology, uh, logic, psychology, rhetoric. Um, he he was dealing in every, uh, let's say, field. Uh, and a large part of the, 
the lexicon of, of how we operate today is based upon on him. So he, mm. he effectively shaped the world and handed off the way that we see the world to the, every generation since. And we're still wearing the glasses that he gave us. There's the subject, which is observing objects in the world and the objects are deterministic and they're made of substance. And then the subjects are presumably not substance, um, but they're connected to substance somehow. So there, there's this idea of the subject and the object, which is one of these features that is self-evident to us because we haven't interrogated it in the same way that inflation is self-evident to everyone in the modern world because they've not interrogated that right. there's a problem with the concept. So uh, according to kind of you know materialism, mind and consciousness are byproducts of this material process, right? So the the world, the table, and the you know our bodies are made up of these objects, mm -hmm. and that we are emergent from those. The subjects are emergent from the objects, mm -hmm. which obviously means that by definition we are emergent from a deterministic property of objects, which means that there can't be free will. I would just throw in here that the Newtonian clockwork mechanical view of the universe, which I think many of us still hold, we still think, mm -hmm. oh, everything's reducible to atoms. You know, it's very simple cause and effect. Um, all of that, I guess the first point would be inherits its basis from Aristotle. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's a, a long line of thinkers that gets to Newton clearly, um, but, but that is the basis is subject, object, duality. And then there's this, that we're, we're, you've, as you've already mentioned, this one contradiction we're already pointing to where if you have deterministic clockwork causality in physical reality, how can that possibly give rise to what we perceive to be free will, which is right, you know, our freedom of choice, consciousness and action. There's, there's an inherent contradiction in pure objectivity, uh, effervescing a subjective being, right? And this is mm -hmm. where pure materialists like Sam Harris would say free will doesn't exist. They would say it is yeah. all deterministic all the way through. Um, but that doesn't seem right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, and, and it's that unnerving thing of like, okay, it, there's a sort of underlying anxiety that comes from approaching these questions because yeah. it's yeah. like, where do you start? Because if you accept one premise, then we're all robots. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. And if you accept the other premise, which is that we are subjective, it means that you can't trust uh, we're, physical reality. We're all postmodernists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to go in that direction. Yeah. For, yeah. Under no circumstance. Um, well, that's that's the danger. Then I guess is that we're, you're either clockwork, mechanical, determinist, or you're like pure moral relativist. There's no there's no anchor. Or objective, again, I don't like the word objective, but there's no consensus direction to reality. Everyone's yeah. opinion, everyone's truth is their own truth kind of thing. Yeah, and and later on, we're going to get onto that idea of consensus, objective reality actually being a consensus model, which is mm -hmm. going to be interesting. Um, but first, we'll have to establish what exactly in reality is participating in that consensus model. Mm -hmm. And the answer is everything, um, mm -hmm. which is we we'll have to break that apart. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the, the the problem with the division that, that Aristotle gave us that we've all been working on the assumption of. So uh, Piersig says, in any hierarchy of metaphysical classification, the most important division is the first one. For this division dominates everything beneath it. If this first division is bad, there is no way you can ever build a really good system of classification around it. You know, we spoke about this offline before and you used a very good the phrasing that you used was great which is that in a subject object metaphysics um we've got a binary here which is you either have zero interpretations of truth purely objective mm -hmm. so every there is one reality and we're all existing around it or there's infinite interpretations of truth which means that everyone's got their own truth which means yeah. that we're living in a madhouse yes so and and you can actually see that in the world right now in this world that we're living in, this this insanity, which is being um, the flames of this insanity, is being you know uh, is being gasoline is being thrown on it right. by the, the the fiat system, yeah, because it's actually it's pushing towards the idea of destroying objective reality for the purposes of of um, politics. Yeah, and paradoxically, both of these opposite binaries point toward 
a similar flavor of nihilism in a way. It's like if everything's subjective and nothing matters and I'm my own truth and I'm just going to do whatever I want as everyone else should do. Or if it's purely deterministic clockwork, then the, you know, fate and history has already been written. So I'm just along for the ride. Like yeah, it, it, yeah. It both in, it's interesting how they're complete opposites, but they both remove agency almost entirely. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. The, and as, as we'll move into, as we, dive deeper into Piercig's model and the presuppositions that come with it, the entire purpose for metaphysics really is ultimately down to um, providing you a, a, a map for action mm -hmm. because all we can do is act, right? And effectively right. subject object metaphysics is effectively questioning whether action is even a feature of reality because if it's deterministic, we're not acting because right. we're not valuing anything. There's no purpose, yeah. There's no purpose. So, yeah. so, and I don't, no one wants to live in that world where there's no value, where, where truth doesn't exist, love doesn't exist, and action is futile. Like, well, why bother? Nihilism. So, yeah. so and then the, if you accept that empiricism cannot validate or will not affirm the existence of truth or love, then the next domino that drops in that line is, well, where is morality? Is there morality? Mm -hmm. And and arguably, under the empirical rubric, no, there is no morality. Mm -hmm. Piercig says, if the belief in free will is abandoned, morality must seemingly also be abandoned under a subject-object metaphysics. If man follows the cause and effect laws of substance, then man cannot really choose between right and wrong. On the other hand, if the determinists let go of their position, it would seem to deny the truth of science. If one adheres to a traditional scientific metaphysics of substance, the philosophy of determinism is an inescapable corollary. If everything, quote unquote, is included in the class of substance and its properties are included in the class of things that always follow laws and people are included in the class everything, then it is an airtight logical conclusion that people always follow the laws of substance. So that's our catch-22, subject-object effectively shackles us to this this paradox yes and, and as i understand it that is the crux of the debate and disagreement between sam harris and jordan peterson is this phrase you can't get an ought from an is which mm -hmm. is to say uh and it, i guess jordan would be arguing the affirmative that you cannot get an ought from an is whereas sam is saying you can get an ought from an is so you can take objective facts and derive a morality, whereas Peterson's more on the side of no, there, there is this uh, wisdom, tradition, religion, mythology, which sort of informs the ought aspect of being. But again, this argument ought and is, we're trapped within subject object duality. Yes. And when you come to see them as, I guess I would use the Verveke term here, conformity, they're both mutually informing, informing or co-determining that's when you're starting to transition into the metaphysics of quality. Uh, you're, you're leaving Aristotelian subject object metaphysics and moving into the metaphysics of quality, which is more relational in its nature. Yeah. And I think this is a great point actually to talk about Piercig in that, in the context of Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, Piercig is a composite of the two, mm -hmm. but I would say that he's both more advanced than both of them in that he's fully integrated their contradictory arguments and then found mm -hmm. a, a, synth a synthesizing solution by challenging the presuppositions that both of them are sitting upon. Mm -hmm. And Peterson was moving towards uh, explaining or, or moving towards, let's say, the ideology or the philosophy of uh, Piercing in Maps of Meaning. And Harris, unfortunately, I, I think he's exiled far off into, into the world of, of scientific. Um, he's locked himself into a room of scientific rationalism in a world that's predicated on human action, um, trying to build a morality around a, a device which can merely validate a theory uh, retroactively, you can't mm. use that device to look into the future. You can you can only use it to well, you can use it to infer things, mm -hmm. but you, you can't make it the foundation of of, of morality. Um, so it doesn't tell you what you what you know what you should do. It tells you what you can do, right. uh, and those those are two different things, right? You know, it's like yeah. it's like in the the quote in Jurassic Park uh, when when 
they're talking about the idea of if you discovered the means to, to bring back dinosaurs, you know, it's like your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they never stopped to ask the question whether they should. Right. Wow. Piercing says, traditional scientific method has always been, at the very best, 2020 hindsight. It's good for seeing where you've been. It's good for testing the truth of what you think you know, but it can't tell you where you ought to go. What Sam Harris is trying to do, and I think it's a, it's a futile en enterprise, is he's trying to wedge inside of you know, empiricism and scientific, the scientific mindset. Mm. He's trying to um, force something which is unforceable, which is that he's trying to, to find a, uh, a solution to morality inside of um, a device which is, was never designed to handle morality. Yeah, um, yeah, and well, it, it never could. Yeah, absolutely. And it's back to this point that the great power of science is that we are filtering out individual value, individual values, individual value yeah. judgments. And that gives you a very high resolution, value free is kind of the aim, mm -hmm. depiction of reality, which is proven to be exceptionally useful, right? We've become very technologically powerful, we've developed a great deal of prowess. But again, that comes with trade offs. Yeah, and I think that the, the trade offs are what we're going to jump into. So causation and substance yeah so okay so back to to the problems with empiricism let's talk about two aspects of empiricism which empiricism itself can validate as being non-existent which is mm -hmm. uh substance and causation mm -hmm. so if if uh you wanted to validate empirically the existence of substance uh you can't because of quantum physics has, has, has proven that substance itself is an illusion mm -hmm. or it's a it's a bias that we have that we we've got a lens that says this table holds together because it's made of substance mm -hmm. but we know that that's not the way the subatomic universe works that it's not actually a fixed matter it's it's something else and also causation much like love and truth well you can't point a microscope at causation piercing says empirically speaking there is no such thing as causation you never see it, touch it, hear it, or feel it. You never experience it in any way. This has not been a minor philosophic or scientific platypus. We'll describe what platypus means in a minute. This has been a real showstopper. The amount of paper consumed in dissertations on this one metaphysical problem must equal whole forests of pulpwood. In classical science, it was supposed that the world always worked in terms of absolute certainty and the cause is the more appropriate word to describe it. But in modern quantum physics, all that has changed. An individual particle is not absolutely committed to one predictable behavior. Yeah, I, and I think this is a very critical point in that the empiricism, let's say the empiricism of science itself is taking us into quantum mechanics as the most accurate description <clears throat> of the universe. And at that level of analysis, causation does not exist. Causation, yeah. and I, I would add further, the concept of particles or, or elementary subunits of materialistic reality do not exist either in, in the quantum domain. Particles, in fact, are actually just interacting wave patterns. Mm -hmm. So what we see at this level of resolution is just uh, an infinite complexity of interacting waves we call different points of those waves interacting particles. We say this mm -hmm. is an electron, this is a neutron, this is a proton. Um, so in fact, it looks more like uh, probability, right? There's probabilities at this level of analysis. There's not strict mechanical causality as we think about it when we think of, you know, a grandfather clock or something like that. Yeah, and, and I think, yeah, just to, to offer up, let's say, a, a kind of morsel of where we're going with this, because to hear this in isolation of what Piersig proposes is really dis it's kind of discombobulating because you kind of go, well, of course, causation exists. How It has to. Mm -hmm. And what are you offering up in, in replacement of it? Because I can clearly see that if I tip this bottle over, it's, you know, I'm going to I'm going to push it and it's going to fall over. Mm -hmm. What Piercing is basically saying is that what we call causality, from a pragmatic point of view, the world has predictable outcomes under certain circumstances. But 
what is allowing for that predictability is not fixed deterministic rules, mm. but actually stacked consensus models of probabilistic outcomes that are defined by uh, preference at every single tier of existence from the subatomic particle all the way through to the human actor. When we say that something is a deterministic law, what we are actually saying is that the probability of this happening is so high that it may as well be a fixed law. Yes. But it is merely probability based upon trillions of subordinate value preferences being made by the patterns that make up existence. Yes. And that those patterns, we, we have to, for mental practicality, separate the world into uh, units for, for pragmatic purposes. That's what the left hemisphere is responsible for. Right. It's one mode of thinking, which is why we see waves uh, in right hemispheric thought, but we see particles in left hemispheric thought because they're modes of perception that the brain allows us. Yes. But in reality, there is no such thing as uh, causal laws, which right. sounds ridiculous, but it's probabilistic outcomes that are yeah. so high in probability that they appear to be rules, unbreakable rules. Yeah, it sounds at the outset like crazy talk almost. Yeah. But again, keeping your mind open if we stop to consider, I think the, the key point here with causality, at least, and we could say maybe the materialism of particles as well, because that that they're, they're related, right? The fact that we think of billiard balls, the billiard balls mm -hmm. model, right? I shoot, I hit the cue ball here and it hits the billiard bar, balls a certain way and they move in a certain pattern. It's just a causal wave. We think that is integrated everywhere in the universe. We have all these little billiard balls of microscopic particles or elementary particles just knocking into each other. Um, but what I would I'd point to here is that empiricism is sawing off the very branch on which it rests, right? We followed that model all the way down to the quantum territory. And now we see very clearly empirically even that that is not true. It is fundamentally yeah. not true. Um, and what we observe as causal to your point is more like a uh, emergent property of this assimilation of preferences. Now this sounds wild yeah. too, but uh, as we'll get deeper into this, Persig is making the argument that preferences exist at every level. We right now yeah. sort of uh, in our own egoism, assume that only we have preferences and that other, even animals, we don't assume have that much of a preference or more instinctual and certainly mm -hmm. inorganic reality doesn't exhibit a preference, but he's he's changing the uh, view on that. The appearance of it being 100% cause, uh, you know, 100%, it's, it's always going to do that, no matter what, which which gives it the, the appearance of a causal law, mm -hmm. is only because at the resolution of the constituents that make up that outcome, in their democratic consensus, give the appearance of an outcome consistently. But, you know, there, there might be particles that, that had different preferences, but yeah. were one in a million. And right. because the other, nine, you know, 999,999 uh, particles preferred to have a consistent um, preference under certain conditions, mm -hmm. there's a consistency which, from the observer's perspective, is basically airtight. Right. Um, so in the same way that in a democratic model of people voting, um, you know, depending on the conditions, you'll always get an outcome of people voting towards a certain way. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's a rule that everyone will vote that way. It just means that under these certain conditions, it's preferred that of these choices, they'll move towards this right. action. Yeah, um, you're, we're getting discrete outcomes, although there may be continuous um, action underneath it, right? There could be like 80, to your, to your example of voting, 80% voted this guy, 20% voted this guy. All we see is the result of the election. We don't see yeah. the actual voting patterns beneath it. And if you were to look at a historical, uh, let's say, 10 years of voting patterns, and you were to look at the highest, the, the, the lowest resolution outcome of those complex voting mechanisms, you would just see 10 years in a row that the same party was voted for. Right. If you were, let's say, being simplistic in your worldview, you would say that it's a law of human nature that this party would always win. That's right. But that's not the case. Right. Um, the 11th year, your rule could be broken, you know, and it, it comes down to, you know, like what Taleb talks about that, um, you know, it, it's easy to start to 
simplify the world into this will always be the outcome because you've seen a, a pattern of it right. repeating. Yes. But we'll, we'll get into the details of that more because it really is. A, I think it's a, a great example. I would just say that the meta part of the, our progress here with the metaphysics of quality is grabbing that model of reality. It's an excellent mm -hmm. model, actually, the voting versus the result and pulling that down into the inorganic layers. Yeah. And we will, and I think it's worth pointing out here for, you know, we're talking abstractions here, but Piersig makes a solid uh, communicable configuration or a framework in which to articulate his model, which is logically and morally bulletproof. Mm -hmm. But we first need to go through these steps of setting up because he, he basically yep. has two books, which he went to great length to carefully chronologically order to, to slowly take apart your, your assumptions and then to build them back up. And that right. in itself is the disassembly of our, of our filters is, is, is goddamn complicated, taking yes. people's yeah. glasses off. And I'd also go on to say that the seeing the world through a causal framework is not a pointless exercise. It's, it's, a, it's a utility to, mm -hmm. to see the world and to say, well, there's, there's predictable causal rules here. It's a, it's a psychotechnology to see the world yes. that way. So yes. Aristotle's model is a psychotechnology that has pragmatic value. That, that's a great way to put it to psychotechnology because different tools for different jobs, right? And I think he gives the later example of different coordinate systems, like one coordinate system is useful in one situation, one's useful in another. And that's effectively what we're saying here is that you're getting two different depictions of reality depending on how you're looking at it. When you're holding a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail, right? right. So what we're, what we're proposing here or what Piercing is proposing is you need to know when to put the hammer down and to pick up another tool. That's right. So if you're trying to use the hammer of Aristotle's subject-object metaphysics on the subject of uh, morality, yeah. then you, you, you're really going to break whatever it is you're trying to operate on. Yeah. Um, you're going towards nihilism, frankly. Yeah. At either yeah, extreme you, of the binary. Yeah. No. Yeah, exactly. So so causation, we'll we'll get into more of that in a second. So that's one that's one of the foundations of empiricism, which empiricism itself cannot validate. Yeah. And the other foundation which which adds to this quicksand of empiricism is substance, mm -hmm. uh, which is another illusion that we have of a constant uh, kind of form which holds its 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 shape in the 3D realm, mm -hmm. in the physical realm, and I'm going to just put this onto Piercing again. So it's a quote from the book which I've mm -hmm. truncated because we'll expand upon it as we add his principles. He says, "Like causation, substance is a derived concept, not anything that is directly experienced. No one has ever seen substance, and no one ever will. All people ever see is data." It is assumed that what makes the data hang together in consistent patterns that they adhere to is this substance. The data of quantum physics indicate that what are called subatomic particles cannot possibly fill the definition of a substance. The properties exist, then disappear, then exist, and then disappear again in little bundles called quanta. These bundles are not continuous in time, yet an essential defined characteristic of substance is that it is continuous in time. Since the quantum bundles are not substance, and since it is a usual scientific assumption that these subatomic particles compose everything there is, then it follows that there is no substance anywhere in the world, nor has there ever been. The whole concept is a grand metaphysical illusion. Okay, so this is another one of those scary things of like, okay, but I'm looking at substance right now, I'm 35 years old, I've always seen substance, mm. and now I have to get my head around the fact that this table is made up of subatomic particles which don't follow any deterministic rules, that don't adhere to Newtonian physics, which therefore doesn't make sense in the, the, the world of subjects and objects. You follow that chain back long enough and you suddenly realize that you're living in the matrix, right? Which mm -hmm. is that this is, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm seeing an illusion. Right. And the conjurer of this illusion is Aristotle, who handed us the, the, the psychotechnology of, of his metaphysics as a way of seeing the world. And it had such high quality, pragmatic value to us as a, as a species for 2000 years, mm -hmm. that it helped us navigate the world in the same way that Einstein's theories of relativity help us navigate at the resolution of certain scales. Mm -hmm. But they break down at the subatomic level and they break down at the, you know, the macro level. So again, we're not, we're not uh, degrading subject-object metaphysics as being uh, an illicit, illegal 
psychotechnology. Mm. It's just that we need to accept that it's its practical applications start to fall apart when you really interrogate what it's implying for the universe. And then the next question is, well, how can we navigate around these fallacies in a way that will offer us more pragmatic value in seeing the world in a more realistic frame, right. you know, in a more truthful frame? Yes. So what then is substance in the metaphysics of quality framework? The answer provided by the metaphysics of quality is similar to that given for causation. Strike out the word substance wherever it appears and substitute the expression stable inorganic pattern of value. Again, the difference is linguistic. It doesn't make a whit of difference in the laboratory which term is used. No dials change their reading. The observed laboratory data is exactly the same. The greatest benefit of this substitution of value for causation and substance is that it allows an integration of physical science with other areas of experience that have been traditionally considered outside the scope of scientific thought. So substance is interesting because this is a great example of metaphor being embedded in our language. Substance actually means to stand beneath. So this is cognitively where we're trying to get beneath how we're looking at the world to look at it from the bottom up and see the truth of it in a way. And we have now identified this word substance with something material, right? Even when we're describing it right now, we're saying substance is an illusion. What we mean is material reality is an illusion. So we're actually getting to the substance of substance itself. We're getting beneath substance and looking at it in a different way. And the, you know, the subject object metaphysics would just look at this as a cognitive expedient of sort. Like we're calling these things particles, we're calling this material reality because it's just a useful fiction in a way. So you, yeah, it's a useful lie. Um, yeah. Where at the actual fundamental level of perception, say the quantum realm, there are no things at all. There are just mm -hmm. events or processes or probabilities or waves. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's patterns, right? It's patterns yeah. all the way down. And so mm -hmm. we have to accept that, that what we know empirically about reality takes us to a place that says empiricism does not exist. Yes. So when we yeah. get to the substance of substance, it is all patterns. And now hopefully this is unlocking your mind, like, okay, maybe I can start to put on a new psychotechnological lens and, and look at the world. Isik says, in classical science, it was supposed that the world always works in terms of absolute certainty and that quote unquote cause is the more appropriate word to describe it. But in modern quantum physics, all that has changed. Particles prefer to do what they do. An individual particle is not absolutely committed to one predictable behavior. What appears to be an absolute cause is just a very consistent pattern of preferences. Therefore, when you strike cause from the language and substitute value, you are not only replacing an empirically meaningless term with a meaningful one, you are using a term that is more appropriate to the actual observation. In the metaphysics of quality, quote unquote causation is a metaphysical term that can be replaced by quote unquote value. To say that A causes B, or to say that B values precondition A, is to say the same thing. The difference is one of words only. Instead of saying a magnet causes iron fillings, to move towards it, you can say iron fillings value movement toward a magnet. Scientifically speaking, neither statement is more true than the other. It may sound a little awkward, but that's a matter of linguistic custom, not science. The language used to describe the data is changed, but the scientific data itself is unchanged. The same is true in every other scientific observation Phaedrus could think of. You can always substitute B values precondition A for A causes B without changing any facts of science at all. The term cause can be struck out completely from a scientific description of the universe without any loss of accuracy or completeness. The only difference between causation and value is that the word cause implies absolute certainty, whereas the implied meaning of value is one of preference. And in a nutshell, that is the Copernican perspectival revolution here, as it's swapping out A causes B for B values precondition A. And it just, yeah. again, the data is the same, but the interpretation changes radically. And I think this 
coheres well with the fundamental axiom of Austrian economics, which is man must act. This means that an, an action is distinguished from behavior and that action expresses purpose, right? And purpose is always aimed towards value, right? And I've said this many times, but to even walk across the room, you have to value the other side of the room more than you value where you're at currently. So we could say all action is irrefutably an expression of value. Value is inspiring all action. And if I zoom out to the universe and we see, okay, the only thing that doesn't change in the universe is change itself. The whole universe is ceaselessly changing. Change is action, but action is value expressed. So I think the big divide here is we used to draw this bright line and say, all right, we're humans, we act with purpose, but things beneath us, animals and inorganic reality, just act based on instinct or causality. Persig's just saying, no, 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 that's wrong. What you think you know here at the human level it's, it is translatable all the way down. So we have value all the way down, driving all action in the universe, all change, all exchange, all evolution.